This is from my podcast, Down to Sleep, where I read books to help you get a good night's rest. You can listen for free here, Spotify, or other apps. Come and support the podcast on Patreon and get a bonus episode every single week, as well as vote on what book I read next. Hit like and subscribe, and enjoy. The Secret Garden by Francis Hodgson Burnett Chapter 1 There is no one left When Mary Lennox was sent to Misselthwaite Manor to live with her uncle, everybody said she was the most disagreeable-looking child ever seen. It was true, too. She had a little thin face and a little thin body, thin light hair and a sour expression. Her hair was yellow, and her face was yellow because she had been born in India and had always been ill in one way or another. Her father had held a position under the English government, and had always been busy and got ill himself, and her mother had been a great beauty, who cared only to go to parties and amuse herself with gay people. She had not wanted a little girl at all, and when Mary was born she handed her over to the care of an ayah, who was made to understand that if she wished to please the Mem Sahib she must keep the child out of sight as much as possible. So when she was a sickly, fretful, ugly little baby, she was kept out of the way. And when she became a sickly, fretful, toddling thing, she was kept out of the way also. She never remembered seeing familiarly anything but the dark faces of her ayah and the other native servants. And as they always obeyed her and gave her her own way in everything, because the Mem Sahib would be angry if she was disturbed by her crying... By the time she was six years old, she was as tyrannical and selfish a little pig as ever lived. The young English governess who came to teach her to read and write disliked her so much that she gave up her place in three months. And when other governesses came to try and fill it, they always went away in a shorter time than the first one. So if Mary had not chosen to really want to know how to read books, she would never have learned her letters at all. One frightfully hot morning when she was about nine years old, she awakened feeling very cross, and she became crosser still when she saw that the servant who stood by her bedside was not her ayah. "'Why did you come?' she said to the strange woman. "'I will not let you stay. Send my ayah to me.' The woman looked frightened, but she only stammered that the ayah could not come, and when Mary threw herself into a passion and beat and kicked her, she looked only more frightened and repeated that it was not possible for the ayah to come to Missy Sahib. There was something mysterious in the air that morning. Nothing was done in its regular order. Several of the native servants seemed missing, while those whom Mary saw slunk or hurried about with ashy and scared faces. But no one would tell her anything, and her ayah did not come. She was actually left alone as the morning went on, and at last she wandered out in the garden and began to play by herself under a tree near the veranda. She pretended that she was making a flower bed. She stuck big scarlet hibiscus blossoms into little heaps of earth, all the time growing more and more angry, muttering to herself the things that she would say in the name she would call Saidi when she returned. Pig, pig, daughter of pigs, she said because to call a native a pig is the worst insult of all. She was grinding her teeth and saying this over and over again when she heard her mother come out on the veranda with someone. She was with a fair young man, and they stood talking together in low, strange voices. Mary knew the fair young man who looked like a boy. She had heard that he was a very young officer who had just come from England. The child stared at him she stared most at her mother. She always did this when she had a chance to see her, because the Mem Sahib, Mary used to call her that oftener than anything else, was such a tall, slim, pretty person, and wore such lovely clothes. Her hair was like curly silk, and she had a delicate little nose, which seemed to be disdaining things, and she had large, laughing eyes. All of her clothes were thin and floating, and Mary said they were full of lace. They looked fuller of lace than ever this morning, but her eyes were not laughing at all. They were large and scared and lifted imploringly to the fair boy officer's face. Is it so very bad, oh, is it? Mary heard her say. 
Awfully, the young man answered in a trembling voice. Awfully, Mrs. Lennox. You ought to have gone to the hills two weeks ago. The Mem Sahib wrung her hands. Oh, I know I ought, she cried. I only stayed to go to that silly dinner party. What a fool I was. At that very moment, such a loud sound of wailing broke out from the servant's quarters that she clutched the young man's arm, and Mary stood shivering from head to foot. The wailing grew wilder and wilder. What is it? What is it? Mrs. Lennox gasped. Someone has died, answered the boy officer. You did not say it had broken out among your servants. I did not know, she cried. Come with me, come with me, and she turned and ran into the house. After that, appalling things happened, and the mysteriousness of the morning was explained to Mary. The cholera had broken out in its most fatal form, and people were dying like flies. The ayah had been taken ill in the night, and it was because she had just died that the servants had wailed in the huts. Before the next day, three other servants were dead, and others had run away in terror. There was panic on every side and dying people in all the bungalows. During the confusion and bewilderment of the second day, Mary hid herself in the nursery and was forgotten by everyone. Nobody thought of her, nobody wanted her, and strange things happened of which she knew nothing. Mary alternately cried and slept through the hours. She only knew that people were ill and she heard mysterious and frightening sounds. Once she crept into the dining room and found it empty, though a partly finished meal was on the table and chairs and plates looked as if they had been hastily pushed back when the diners rose, suddenly for some reason. The child ate some fruit and biscuits, and being thirsty she drank a glass of wine which stood nearly filled. It was sweet, and she did not know how strong it was. Very soon it made her intensely drowsy and she went back to her nursery and shut herself in again, frightened by cries that she heard in the huts, and by the hurrying sound of feet. The wine made her so sleepy that she could scarcely keep her eyes open, and she lay down on her bed and knew nothing more for a long time. Many things happened during the hours in which she slept so heavily, but she was not disturbed by the wails and the sound of things being carried in and out of the bungalow. When she awakened, she lay and stared at the wall. The house was perfectly still. She had never known it to be so silent before. She heard neither voices nor footsteps, and wondered if everybody had got well of the cholera and all the trouble was over. She wondered also who would take care of her now that her ayah was dead. There'd be a new ayah and perhaps she would know some new stories. Mary had been rather tired of the old ones. She did not cry because her nurse had died. She was not an affectionate child and had never cared much for anyone. The noise and hurrying about and wailing over the cholera had frightened her, and she had been angry because no one seemed to remember that she was alive. Everyone was too panic-stricken to think of a little girl no one was fond of. When people had the cholera, it seemed that they remembered nothing but themselves. But if everyone had got well again, surely someone would remember and come look for her. But no one came, and as she lay waiting, the house seemed to grow more and more silent. She heard something rustling on the matting, and when she looked down, she saw a little snake gliding along and watching her with eyes like jewels. She was not frightened because he was a harmless little thing. He would not hurt her, and he seemed in a hurry to get out of the room. He slipped under the door as she watched him. How queer and quiet it is, she said. It sounds as if there were no one in the bungalow but me and the snake. Almost the next minute she heard footsteps in the compound, and then on the veranda. They were men's footsteps, and the men entered the bungalow and talked in low voices. No one went to meet or speak to them. and They seemed to open doors and look into rooms. What desolation, she heard one voice say. That pretty, pretty woman, I suppose the child too. I heard there was a child, though no one ever saw her. Mary was standing in the middle of the nursery when they opened the door a few minutes later. She looked an ugly, cross little thing, 
and was frowning because she was beginning to be hungry and feel disgracefully neglected. The first man who came in was a large officer that she had once seen talking to her father. He looked tired and troubled. But when he saw her, he was so startled that he almost jumped back. Barney, he cried out, there's a child here, a child alone. In a place like this, mercy on us, who is she? I am Mary Lennox, the little girl said, drawing herself up stiffly. She thought the man was very rude to call her father's bungalow a place like this. I fell asleep when everyone had the cholera, and I have only just woken up. Why does nobody come? It's the child no one ever saw, exclaimed the man, turning to his companions. She has actually been forgotten. Why was I forgotten, Mary said, stamping her foot. Why does nobody come? The young man, whose name was Barney, looked at her very sadly. Mary even thought she saw him wink his eyes as if to wink tears away. Poor little kid, he said. There's nobody left to come. It was in that strange and sudden way that Mary found out that she had neither father nor mother left, that they had died and been carried away in the night, and that the few native servants who had not died had also left the house as quickly as they could get out of it, none of them remembering that there was Missy Sahib, and this is why this place was so quiet. It was true. There was no one in the bungalow but herself and that little rustling snake. Chapter 2 Mistress Mary Quite Contrary Mary had liked to look at her mother from a distance, and she had thought her very pretty. But as she knew very little of her, she could scarcely have been expected to love her or to miss her very much when she was gone. She did not miss her at all, in fact. And as she was a self-absorbed child, she gave her entire thoughts to herself, as she had always done. If she had been older, she would no doubt have been very anxious at being left alone in the world. But she was very young and as she had always been taken care of, she supposed she always would be. What she thought was that she would like to know if she was going to nice people, who would be polite to her and give her her own way, as her ayah and her other native servants had done. She knew that she was going to stay at the English clergyman's house where she was taken first. She did not want to stay. The English clergyman was poor and had five children nearly all the same age. They wore shabby clothes and were always quarrelling and snatching toys from each other. Mary hated their untidy bungalow, and was so disagreeable to them that after the first day or two nobody would play with her. By the second day they had given her a nickname, which made her furious. It was Basil who thought of it first. Basil was a little boy with impudent blue eyes and a turned-up nose, and Mary hated him. She was playing by herself under a tree, just as she had been playing the day the cholera broke out. She was making heaps of earth and paths for a garden, and Basil came and stood near to watch her. Presently he got rather interested and suddenly made a suggestion. "'Why don't you put a heap of stones there and pretend it's a rockery?' he said. "'There in the middle,' and leaned over her to point. "'Go away!' cried Mary. "'I don't want boys. Go away!' For a moment Basil looked angry and then began to tease. He was always teasing his sisters. He danced round and round her and made faces and sang and laughed. Mistress Mary, quite contrary, how does your garden grow? With silver bells and cockle shells and marigolds all in a row. He sang it until the other children heard and laughed too, and the crosser Mary got the more they sang, Mistress Mary, quite contrary. And after that, as long as she stayed with them, they called her Mistress Mary quite contrary, when they spoke of her to each other and often when they spoke to her. You're going to be sent home, Basil said to her, at the end of the week, and we're glad of it. I'm glad of it too, answered Mary. Where is home? She doesn't know where home is, said Basil, with seven-year-old scorn. It's England, of course. Our grandmamma lives there, and our sister Mabel was sent to her last year. You're not going to your grandmamma. You have none. You're going to your uncle. His name is Mr. Archibald Craven. I don't know anything about him, snapped Mary. I know you don't, Basil answered. You don't know anything. Girls never do. I heard father and mother talking about him. He lives in a great big desolate old house in the country, and no one goes near him. 
He's so cross he won't let them, and they wouldn't come if he would let them. He's a hunchback, and he's horrid. I don't believe you, said Mary, and she turned her back and stuck her fingers in her ears, because she would not listen any more. But she thought over it a great deal afterward, and when Mrs. Crawford told her that night she was going to sail away to England in a few days and go to her uncle, Mr. Archibald Craven, who lived in Misselthwaite Manor, she looked so stony and stubbornly uninterested that they did not know what to think of her. They tried to be kind to her, but she only turned her face away when Mrs. Crawford attempted to kiss her, held herself stiffly when Mr. Crawford patted her shoulder. "'She's such a plain child,' Mrs. Crawford said pityingly afterwards. "'Her mother was such a pretty creature. She had a very pretty manner, too. "'And Mary has the most unattractive ways I ever saw in a child. "'The children call her Mistress Mary quite contrary. "'Though it's naughty of them, one can't help understanding it. "'Perhaps if her mother had carried her pretty face and pretty manners oftener into the nursery, "'Mary might have learned some pretty ways, too.' It's very sad now the beautiful thing is gone to remember that many people never even knew that she had a child at all. I believe she scarcely ever looked at her, sighed Mrs. Crawford. When her eye was dead, there was no one to give a thought to the little thing. Think of the servants running away and leaving her all alone in that deserted bungalow. Colonel McGrew said he nearly jumped out of his skin when he opened the door and found her standing by herself in the middle of the room. Mary made the long voyage to England under the care of an officer's wife, who was taking her children to leave them in a boarding school. She was very much absorbed in her own little boy and girl, and was rather glad to hand the child over to the woman Mr. Archibald Craven sent to meet her in London. The woman was his housekeeper at Misselthwaite Manor, and her name was Mrs. Medlock. She was a stout woman, with very red cheeks and sharp black eyes. She wore a very purple dress, a black silk mantle with jet fringe on it and a black bonnet, with purple velvet flowers which stuck up and trembled when she moved her head. Mary did not like her at all, but as she very seldom liked people, there was nothing remarkable in that, besides which it was very evident that Mrs. Medlock did not think much of her. "'My word, she's a plain little piece of goods,' she said. "'And we'd heard her mother was a beauty. "'She hasn't handed much of it down, has she, ma'am? "'Perhaps she'll improve as she grows older,' the officer's wife said good-naturedly. "'If she were not so sallow and had a nicer expression, "'her features aren't rather good. "'Children alter so much. "'She'll have to alter a good deal,' answered Mrs. Medlock. "'There's nothing likely to improve children at Misselthwaite, if you ask me.' "'They thought Mary was not listening.' because she was standing a little apart from them at the window of the private hotel that they had gone to. She was watching the passing buses and cabs and people, but she heard quite well, and was made very curious about her uncle and the place that he lived in. What sort of place was it? What would he be like? What was a hunchback? She had never seen one. Perhaps there were none in India. Since she had been living in other people's houses and had no eyes, she had begun to feel lonely and to think queer thoughts which were new to her. She had begun to wonder why she had never seemed to belong to anyone, even when her father and mother had been alive. Other children seemed to belong to their fathers and mothers, but she had never seemed to really be anyone's little girl. She had had servants and food and clothes, but no one had taken any notice of her. She did not know that this was because she was a disagreeable child. But then, of course, she did not know she was disagreeable. She often thought other people were. But she did not know that she was so herself. She thought Mrs. Medlock the most disagreeable person she had ever seen with her common, highly coloured face and common fine bonnet. When the next day they set out on their journey to Yorkshire, she walked through the station to the railway carriage with her head up, trying to keep as far away from her as she could. She did not want to seem to belong to her. It would have made her angry to think people imagined she was her little girl. But Mrs. Medlock was not in the least disturbed by her in her thoughts. She was the kind of woman who would stand no nonsense from young ones. At least that is what she would have said if she had been asked. She had not wanted to go to London just when her sister Maria's daughter was going to be married. But she had a comfortable, well-paid place as a housekeeper at Misselthwaite Manor and the only way in which she could keep it 
was to do at once what Mr. Archibald Craven told her to do. She never dared even ask a question. Captain Lennox and the wife have died of cholera, Mr. Craven had said in his short, cold way. Captain Lennox was my wife's brother, and I am their daughter's guardian. The child is to be brought here. You must go to London and bring her yourself. So she packed her small trunk and made the journey. Mary sat in her corner of the railway carriage and looked plain and fretful. She had nothing to read or to look at. She had folded her thin little black-gloved hands in her lap. Her black dress made her look yellower than ever, and her limp light hair straggled from under her black crepe hat. More marred-looking young one I never saw in my life, Mrs. Medlock thought. Marred is a Yorkshire word and means spoiled and pettish. She'd never seen a child who sat so still without doing anything. And at last she got tired of watching her and began to talk in a brisk, hard voice. Suppose I may as well tell you something about where you're going to, she said. Do you know anything about your uncle? No, said Mary. Never heard your father and mother talk about him? No, said Mary, frowning. She frowned because she remembered that father and mother had never talked to her about anything in particular. Certainly they'd never told her things. <sighs> muttered Mrs. Medlock, staring at her queer, unresponsive little face. She did not say any more for a few moments and then began again. I suppose you might as well be told something to prepare you. You're going to a queer place. Mary said nothing at all, and Mrs. Medlock looked rather discomforted by her apparent indifference, but after taking a breath, she went on. Not but that it's a big, grand place in a gloomy way. Mr. Craven's proud of it in his way, and that's gloomy enough, too. The house is six hundred years old. It's on the edge of a moor. There's near a hundred rooms in it, though most of them are shut up and locked, and pictures and fine old furniture and things that's been there for ages... There's a big park round it, gardens, trees, branches, trailing to the ground, some of them. She paused and took another breath. But there's nothing else, she ended suddenly. Mary had begun to listen in spite of herself. It all sounded so unlike India. Anything new rather attracted her. She did not intend to look as if she were interested. That was one of her unhappy, disagreeable ways. So she sat still. Well, said Mrs. Medlock, what do you think of it? Nothing, she answered. I know nothing about such places. That made Mrs. Medlock laugh, a short sort of laugh. Eh, she said. You are like an old woman. Don't you care? It doesn't matter, said Mary, whether I care or not. Right enough there, said Mrs. Medlock. It doesn't... What you're to be kept at Misselthwaite Manor for, I don't know. Unless it's because it's the easiest way. He's not going to trouble himself about you, that's sure and certain. He never troubles himself about no one. She stopped herself as if she'd just remembered something in time. He's got a crooked back, she said. That set him wrong. He was a sour young man and got no good all his money. A big place till he was married. Mary's eyes turned toward her in spite of her intention not to seem to care. She'd never thought of the hunchback being married and she was a trifle surprised. Mrs. Medlock saw this and... As she was a talkative woman, she continued with more interest. This was one way of passing some time, at any rate. She was a sweet, pretty thing. He'd have walked the world over to get her a blade of grass she wanted. Nobody thought she'd marry him, but she did. People said she married him for his money, but she didn't. She didn't. Positively. When she died, Mary gave a little involuntary jump. Oh, did she die? she exclaimed, quite without meaning to. She just remembered a French fairy story she had once read called Riquette à la Hoop. It had been about a poor hunchback and a beautiful princess and made her suddenly sorry for Mr. Archibald Craven. Yes, she died, Mrs. Medlock answered. It made him queerer than ever. He cares about nobody. He won't see people. Most of the time he goes away, and when he's at Mythelthwaite, he swatches himself up in the West Wing. Won't let but pictures see him. Pitch is an old fellow, but he took care of him when he was a child, and he knows his ways. It sounded like something in a book, and it did not make Mary feel cheerful. A house with a hundred rooms, nearly all shut up, and with their doors locked, a house on the edge of a moor, whatever a moor is, sounds dreary. A man with a crooked back who shut himself up also, she stared out of the window with her lips pinched together. <laughs> 
it seemed quite natural that the rain should have begun to pour down in grey slanting lines and splash and stream down the window panes. If the pretty wife had been alive, she might have made things cheerful by being something like her own mother and running in and out and going to parties as she had done in frocks full of lace. But she was not there any more. "'You needn't expect to see him, because ten to one you won't,' said Mrs. Medlock. "'And you mustn't expect that there'll be people to talk to you. "'You'll have to play about and look after yourself. "'You'll be told what rooms you can go into and what rooms you're to keep out of. "'There's gardens enough. And "'When you're in the house, don't go wandering and poking about. "'Mr. Craven won't have it.' "'I shall not want to go poking about,' said sour little Mary, "'and just as suddenly as she had begun to be rather sorry for Mr. Archibald Craven, "'she began to cease to be sorry and to think,' He was unpleasant enough to deserve all that happened to him. And she turned her face towards the streaming panes of the window of the railway carriage and gazed out at the grey rainstorm, which looked as if it would go on forever and ever. She watched it so long and steadily that the greyness grew heavier and heavier before her eyes, and she fell asleep. She slept a long time, and when she awakened, Mrs. Medlock had bought her lunch basket at one of the stations, and they had some chicken, and cold beef, and bread, and butter, and some hot tea. The rain seemed to be streaming down more heavily than ever. Everybody in the station wore wet and glistening waterproofs. The guard lighted the lamps in the carriage, and Mrs. Medlock cheered up very much over her tea and chicken and beef. She ate a great deal, and afterward fell asleep herself. Mary sat and stared at her and watched her fine bonnet slip on one side, until she herself fell asleep once more in the corner of the carriage, lulled by the splashing of the rain against the windows. It was quite dark when she awakened again. The train had stopped at a station, and Mrs. Medlock was shaking her. "'You've had a sleep,' she said. "'It's time to open your eyes. We're at Thwaite Station, and we've got a long drive before us.' Mary stood up and tried to keep her eyes open while Mrs. Medlock collected her parcels. The little girl did not offer to help her because... In India, native servants always picked up or carried things, and it seemed quite proper that other people should wait on one. The station was a small one. Nobody but themselves seemed to be getting out of the train. The station master spoke to Mrs. Medlock in a rough, good-natured way, pronouncing his words in a queer, broad fashion which Mary found out afterward was Yorkshire. "'I see thou got back,' he said." "'And thus brought the young un with thee?' "'Aye, that, sir,' answered Mrs. Medlock, "'speaking with a Yorkshire accent herself "'and jerking her head over her shoulder towards Mary. "'How's thy missus?' "'Well enough. "'The carriage is waiting outside for thee.' "'A broom stood on the road "'before the little outside platform. "'Mary saw that it was a smart carriage "'and that it was a smart footman "'who helped her in. "'His long waterproof coat and the waterproof covering of his hat were shining and dripping with rain as everything was, the burly station master included. When he shut the door, mounted the box with the coachman, and they drove off, the little girl found herself seated in a comfortably cushioned corner, but she was not inclined to go to sleep again. She sat and looked out of the window, Curious to see something of the road over which she was being driven to the queer place that Mrs. Medlock had spoken of. She was not at all a timid child, and she was not exactly frightened, but she felt that there was no knowing what might happen in a house with a hundred rooms nearly all shut up, a house standing on the edge of a moor. What is a moor? she said suddenly to Mrs. Medlock. "'Look out of the window in about ten minutes and you'll see,' the woman answered. "'We got to drive five miles across Missile Moor before we get to the manor.' 
You won't see much because it's a dark night, but you can see something. Mary asked no more questions, but waited in the darkness of her corner, keeping her eyes on the window. The carriage lamps cast rays of light a little distance ahead of them, and she caught glimpses of the things that they passed. After they had left the station, they had driven through a tiny village. She had seen whitewashed cottages in the lights of a public house. Then they had passed a church and a vicarage, and a little shop window or so in a cottage with toys and sweets and odd things set out for sale. Then they were on the high road and she saw hedges and trees. After that, there seemed nothing different for a long time, or at least it seemed a long time to her. At last, the horses began to go more slowly, as if they were climbing uphill. Presently, there seemed to be no more hedges and no more trees. She could see nothing, in fact, but a dense darkness on either side. She leaned forward and pressed her face against the window just as the carriage gave a big jolt. We're on the moor now, sure enough, said Mrs. Medlock. The carriage lamps shed a yellow light on a rough-looking road which seemed to be cut through bushes and low-growing things, which ended in the great expanse of dark apparently spread out before and around them. A wind was rising and making a singular wild, low, rushing sound. It's... it's not the sea, is it? said Mary, looking around at her companion. No, not it, answered Mrs. Medlock. Nor it isn't fields nor mountains, it's just miles and miles and miles of wild land that nothing grows on, but heather and gorse and broom, and nothing lives on but wild ponies and sheep. I feel as if it might be the sea, if there were water on it, said Mary. It sounds like the sea just now. That's the wind blowing through the bushes, Mrs. Medlock said. It's a wild, dreary enough place to my mind, though there's plenty likes that, particularly when heather's in bloom. On and on they drove through the darkness, and though the rain stopped, the wind rushed by and whistled and made strange sounds. The road went up and down, and several times the carriage passed over a little bridge beneath which water rushed very fast, with a great deal of noise. Mary felt as if the drive would never come to an end, and that the wide, bleak moor was a wide expanse of black ocean through which she was passing on a strip of dry land. I don't like it, she said to herself. I don't like it and she pinched her thin lips more tightly together. The horses were climbing up a hilly piece of road when she first caught sight of a light. Mrs. Medlock saw it as soon as she did and drew a long sigh of relief. Ah, I'm glad to see that bit of light twinkling, she exclaimed. It's the light in the lodge window. We'll get a good cup of tea after a bit at all events. It was after a bit as she said, for when the carriage passed through the park gates, there was still two miles of avenue to drive through, and the trees, which nearly met overhead, made it seem as if they were driving through a long, dark vault. They drove out of the vault into a clear space, and stopped before an immensely long but low-built house which seemed to ramble around a stone court, at first, Mary thought there were no lights at all in the windows, but as she got out of the carriage, she saw that one room in a corner upstairs showed a dull glow. The entrance door was a huge one made of massive, curiously shaped panels of oak studded with big iron nails and bound with great iron bars. It opened into an enormous hall, which was so dimly lighted that the faces in the portraits on the walls and the figures in the suits of armour made Mary feel that she did not want to look at them. As she stood on the stone floor, she looked a very small, odd little black figure. 
and she felt as small and lost and as odd as she looked. A neat, thin old man stood near the manservant who opened the door for them. You are to take her to her room, he said in a husky voice. He doesn't want to see her. He's going to London in the morning. Very well, Mr. Pitcher, Mrs. Medlock answered. So long as I know what's expected of me, I can manage. What's expected of you, Mrs. Medlock, Mr. Pitcher said, is that you make sure that he's not disturbed and that he doesn't see what he doesn't want to see. And then Mary Lennox was led up a broad staircase, down a long corridor and a up a short flight of steps, through another corridor and another until a door opened in a wall and she found herself in a room with a fire in it and a supper on a table. Mrs. Medlock said unceremoniously, Well, here you are. This room and the next are where you'll live, and you must keep to them. Don't you forget that. It was in this way Mistress Mary arrived at Misselthwaite Manor, and she had perhaps never felt quite so contrary in all her life. Chapter 4 Martha When she opened her eyes in the morning, it was because a young housemaid had come into her room to light the fire, and was kneeling on the hearth rug, raking out the cinders noisily. Mary lay and watched her for a few moments, and began to look about the room. She had never seen a room at all like it, and thought that it was curious and gloomy. The walls were covered with tapestry with a forest scene embroidered on it. There were fantastically dressed people under the trees, and in the distance a glimpse of the turrets of a castle. There were hunters and horses and dogs and ladies. Mary felt as if she were in the forest with them. Out of a deep window she could see a great climbing stretch of land which seemed to have no trees on it, and to look rather like an endless, dull, purplish sea. "'What is that?' she said, pointing out of the window. Martha, the young housemaid who had just risen to her feet, looked and pointed also. "'That there?' she said. "'Yes, that's the moor,' with a good-natured grin. "'Does the like that?' "'No,' answered Mary. "'I hate it. "'That's cause thou art not used to it,' Martha said, going back to the hearth. Thou thinks it's too big and bare now, but thou will like it. Do you? inquired Mary. Ay, that I do, answered Martha, cheerfully polishing away at the grate. I just love it. It's none bare, it's covered with growing things, and smells sweet. It's fair lovely in spring and summer, when the gorse and broom and heathers are in flower. It smells of honey, and there's such a lot of fresh air. The sky looks so high, and the bees and skylarks make such a nice noise, humming and singing. Eh, I wouldn't live away from the moor for anything. Mary listened to her with a grave, puzzled expression. The native servants that she had been used to in India were not in the least like this. They were obsequious and servile, and did not presume to talk to their masters as if they were their equals. They made salams and called them protector of the poor and names of that sort. Indian servants were commanded to do things, not asked. It was not the custom to say please and thank you, and Mary had always slapped her eye in the face when she was angry. She wondered a little what this girl would do if one slapped her in the face. She was a round, rosy, good-natured-looking creature, but she had a sturdy way which made Mistress Mary wonder if she might not even slap back, if the person who slapped her was only a little girl. "'You are a strange servant,' she said from her pillows rather haughtily. Martha sat up on her heels with her blacking brush in her hand and laughed, without seeming the least out of temper. "'Eh, I know that,' she said. "'If there was ever a grand missus at Misselthwaite, I should never have even been one of the under-housemaids.' I should might have been let to be a scullery maid, but I'd never have been let upstairs. I'm too common and I talk too much Yorkshire. But this is a funny house for all it's so grand. Seems like there's neither master nor mistress, except Mr. Pitcher and Mrs. Medlock. Mr. Craven, he won't be troubled about anything when he's here, and he's nearly always away. 
Mrs. Medlock gave me the place out of kindness. She told me she could have never done it if Mithelthwaite had been like other big houses. Are you going to be my servant? Mary asked, still in her imperious little Indian way. Martha began to rub her grate again. I'm Mrs. Medlock's servant, she said stoutly, and she, Mr. Craven's, but I'm to do the housemaid's work up here and wait on you a bit. But you won't need much waiting on. Who's going to dress me? demanded Mary. Martha sat up on her heels again and stared. She spoke in broad Yorkshire in her amazement. Can I dress thy sen? she said. What do you mean? I don't understand your language, said Mary. I forgot, Martha said. Mrs. Medlock told me I have to be careful or you wouldn't know what I was saying. I mean, can't you put on your own clothes? No, answered Mary, quite indignantly. I never did in my life. My eye addressed me, of course. Well, said Martha, evidently not in the least aware that she was impudent. It's time thou should learn. Thou cannot begin younger. It'll do thee good to wait on thy sen a bit. My mother always said she couldn't see why grand people's children didn't turn out fair fools. What with nurses and being washed out and dressed and took out to walk as if they were puppies. It is different in India, said Mistress Mary disdainfully. She could scarcely stand this. But Martha was not at all crushed. Eh, I can see it's different, she answered almost sympathetically. I dare say it's because there's such a lot of black there instead of respectable white people. When I heard you was coming from India, I thought you was a black too. Mary sat up in bed furious. What? she said. What? You thought I was a native, you... you daughter of a pig? Martha stared and looked hot. Who are you calling names? she said. You needn't be so vexed. That's not the way for a young lady to talk. I've nothing against the blacks. When you read about them in tracks, they're always very religious. I've never seen a black, and I was fair pleased to think I was going to see one close. When I come in to light your fire this morning, I crept up to your bed and pulled cover back to be careful and have a look at you. There you was. No more black than me. You're so yellow. Mary did not even try to control her rage and humiliation. You thought I was a native. You dared. You don't know anything about natives. They're not people. They're servants who must salam to you. You know nothing about India. You know nothing about anything. She was in such a rage and felt so helpless before the girl's simple stare. Somehow she suddenly felt so horribly lonely. And far away from everything she understood and which understood her. She threw herself face downward in the pillows and burst into passionate sobbing. She sobbed so unrestrainedly that good-natured Yorkshire Martha was a little frightened and quite sorry for her. She went to the bed and bent over her. Hey, you mustn't cry like that there, she begged. You mustn't for sure. I didn't know you'd be vexed. I don't know anything about anything, just like you said. I beg your pardon, miss. Do stop crying. There was something comforting and really friendly in her queer Yorkshire speech and sturdy way, which had a good effect on Mary. She gradually ceased crying and became quiet. Martha looked relieved. Time for thee to get up now, she said. Mrs. Medlock said I was carrying that for breakfast and tea and dinner into next room. It's been made into a nursery for thee. I'll help thee on with thy clothes if thou'll get out of bed. If the buttons are at the back, they cannot button them up themselves. When Mary at last decided to get up, the clothes that Martha took from the wardrobe were not the ones that she had worn when she arrived the night before with Mrs. Medlock. Those are not mine, she said. Mine are black. She looked the thick white wool coat and dress over, and added with cool approval, Those are nicer than mine. These are the ones that must put on, Martha answered. Mr. Craven ordered Mrs. Medlock to get them in London. He said, I won't have a child dressed in black wandering about like a lost soul. He said it'd make the place sadder than it is, put colour on her. Mother, she said she knew what he meant. Mother always knows what her body means. She doesn't hold with black herself. I hate black things, said Mary. The dressing process was one which taught them both something. Martha had 
buttoned up her little sisters and brothers, but she had never seen a child who stood still and waited for another person to do things for her, as if she had neither hands nor feet of her own. "'Why don't you put on your own shoes?' she said when Mary quietly held out her foot. "'My Aya did it,' answered Mary, staring. "'It was the custom.' She said that very often. "'It was the custom.' The native servants were always saying it if one told them to do a thing their ancestors had not done. For a thousand years they gazed at one mildly and said, It is not the custom. And one knew that that was the end of the matter. It had not been the custom that Mistress Mary should do anything but stand and allow herself to be dressed like a doll. But before she was ready for breakfast she began to suspect that her life at Misselthwaite Manor would end by teaching her a number of things quite new to her. Things such as putting on her own shoes and stockings, picking up things that she let fall. If Martha had been a well-trained, fine young lady's maid, she would have been more subservient and respectful, and would have known that it was her business to brush hair and button boots and pick things up and lay them away. She was, however, only an untrained Yorkshire rustic who had been brought up in a moorland cottage with a swarm of little brothers and sisters who had never dreamed of doing anything but waiting on themselves and on the younger ones who were either babies in arms or just learning to totter about and tumble over things. If Mary Lennox had been a child who was ready to be amused, she would perhaps have laughed at Martha's readiness to talk. But Mary only listened to her coldly, and wondered at her freedom of manner. At first she was not at all interested, but gradually, as the girl rattled on in her good-tempered and homely way, Mary began to notice what she was saying. "'I should see them all,' she said. "'There's twelve of us, and my father only gets sixteen shilling a week. I can tell you my mother's put it to porridge for more.' They tumble about on the moor and they play there all day and Mother says the air of the moor fattens them. She says she believes they eat the same grass the wild ponies do. Our Dickon is twelve years old and he's got a young pony he calls his own. Where did he get that? asked Mary. Found it on the moor with its mother when it was a little one. He began to make friends with it, give it bits of bread and pluck young grass for it. And it got to like him. It follows him about and lets him get on its back. Dickon's a kind lad, and animals like him. Mary had never possessed an animal pet of her own, and had always thought that she should like one. She began to feel a slight interest in Dickon, and as she had never before been interested in anyone but herself, it was the dawning of a healthy sentiment. When she went into the room which had been made into a nursery for her, She found that it was rather like the one that she had slept in. It was not a child's room, but a grown-up person's room, with gloomy old pictures on the walls and heavy old oak chairs. A table in the centre was set with a good substantial breakfast, but she had always had a very small appetite, and she looked with something more than indifference at the first plate that Martha set before her. "'I don't want it,' she said. "'Thou doesn't want thy porridge,' Martha exclaimed incredulously. "'No. Thou doesn't know how good it is. "'Put a bit of treacle on it or a bit of sugar.' "'I don't want it,' repeated Mary. "'Eh?' said Martha. "'I can't abide to see good victuals go waste. "'If our children was at this table, they'd clean it bare in five minutes.' "'Why?' said Mary coldly. "'Why?' echoed Martha. "'Cause they scarce ever had their stomachs full in their lives.' They're as hungry as young hawks and foxes. I don't know what it is to be hungry, said Mary with a indifference of ignorance. Martha looked indignant. Well, it would do thee good to try it. I can see that plain enough, she said outspokenly. I've no patience with folk as sit and just stares at good bread and meat. My word, don't I wish Dickon and Phil and Jane and the rest of them had what's here under their pinafores? Why don't you take it to them, suggested Mary. "'It's not mine,' answered Martha stoutly. "'And this isn't my day out. "'I get my day out once a month, same as rest. "'Then I go home and I clean up for mother "'and give her a day's rest.' 
Mary drank some tea, and ate a little toast and some marmalade. "'You wrap up warm and run out and play you,' said Martha. "'It'll do you good and give you some stomach for your meat.' Mary went to the window. There were gardens and paths and big trees. But everything looked dull and wintry. Out! Why should I go out on a day like this? Well, if thou doesn't go out, thou'll have to stay in. And what has thou got to do? Mary glanced about her. There was nothing to do. When Mrs. Medlock had prepared the nursery, she had not thought of amusement. Perhaps it would be better to go and see what the gardens were like. Who will go with me? she inquired. Martha stared. You'll go by yourself, she answered. You'll have to learn to play like other children does when they haven't got sisters and brothers. Our Dickon goes off on the moor by himself and plays for hours. That's how he made friends with the pony. He's got sheep on the moor that knows him and a bird that comes and eats out of his hand. However little there is to eat, he always saves a bit of his bread to coax his pets. It was really this mention of Dickon which made Mary decide to go out, though she was not aware of it. There would be birds outside, though there would not be ponies or sheep. They would be different from the birds in India, but it might amuse her to look at them. Martha found her coat and her hat for her and a pair of stout little boots, and she showed her her way downstairs. "'If thou goes round that way, that'll come to the gardens,' she said, pointing to a gate in a wall of shrubbery. "'Lots of flowers in summertime, but there'll be nothing blooming now.' She seemed to hesitate a second before she added, "'One of the gardens is locked up. No one's been in it for ten years.' "'Why?' asked Mary in spite of herself." Here was another locked door added to the hundred in a strange house. Mr. Craven had it shut when his wife died so sudden. He won't let no one go inside. It was her garden. He locked the door and dug a hole and buried the key. There's Mrs. Medlock's bell ringing. I must run. After she was gone, Mary turned down the walk which led to the door in the shrubbery. She could not help thinking about the garden which no one had been into for ten years. She wondered what it would look like, whether there were flowers still alive in it. When she had passed through the shrubbery gate, she found herself in great gardens with wide lawns and winding walks with clipped borders. There were trees and flower beds and evergreens clipped into strange shapes a large pool with an old grey fountain in its midst. But the flower beds were bare and wintry, and the fountain was not playing. This was not the garden which was shut up. How could a garden be shut up? You could always walk into a garden. She was just thinking this when she saw that at the end of the path she was following, there seemed to be a long wall, with ivy growing over it. She was not familiar enough with England to know that she was coming upon the kitchen gardens, where the vegetables and fruit were growing. She went towards the wall and found that there was a green door in the ivy, and that it stood open. This was not the closed garden, evidently, and she could go into it. She went through the door and found that it was a garden with walls all around it and that it was only one of several walled gardens which seemed to open into one another. She saw another open green door revealing bushes and pathways between beds containing winter vegetables. Fruit trees were flat against the wall. Over some of the beds there were glass frames. The place was bare and ugly enough, Mary thought, as she stood there and stared about her. It might be nice in summer when things were green, but there was nothing pretty about it now. Presently, an old man with a spade over his shoulder walked through the door leading from the second garden. He looked startled when he saw Mary, and then touched his cap. He had a surly old face and did not seem at all pleased to see her. But then she was displeased with his garden, and 
and wore her quite contrary expression, and certainly did not seem at all pleased to see him. And that is where we shall close the book on tonight's episode. 